welcome back to the Rock Your Retirement Show. I'm your host, Kathy Klein, and today, once again, I have two co-hosts back with me on this series on living overseas. If you've considered living overseas, you must listen to this series. If you didn't listen to the first and second part of this, go on back and listen to those first. It might make a little more sense if you listen to them in order. In last week's episode, we talked about the five things you must know before moving overseas. And today we're discussing a very important subject, and that is how to decide where to retire. Most of us not only want a place where we can afford to live, but also where we have other like-minded people that we can be friends with. We'll discuss where we're retiring and why. And then next week, we are going to discuss bank safety in addition to one particular country, Ecuador, and why my co-host decided to live there. My guests have written hundreds of articles on retiring and living overseas. They are the authors of three best-selling Amazon books, and they have a course for people who want to dive deeper on the subject of retiring overseas. But before we start, I wanted to tell you that this episode is brought to you by the Medicare Quick Step-by-Step -Step Guide for Signing Up for Medicare. If you are signing up for Medicare, you already know how confusing it can be. This step-by-step -step guide is absolutely free and will help you easily make the transition into Medicare. Get it free at medicarequick.com slash checklist. Ed and Cynthia, thank you both for putting up with my technical difficulties and for coming back to the show to tell your story. You know, my husband and I decided on our retirement home and first we created a spreadsheet that compared the different locations. So what were some of the things that you did before deciding on Ecuador as your perfect retirement location? Thanks, Kathy, for having us this morning. Um, what we did when we realized that retiring abroad was our best option is we sat down and created uh, what we call a wish list of everything that we were, would be looking for in a retirement abroad destination. So we added to that wish list and uh, Ed, Ed will tell you some of the things that we put on that list. Well, as you mentioned, cost of living was at the top for us. We got wiped out in 2008 with the economic recession or whatever, the Great Recession. And um, beyond that, when you first look at the globe, you think, my gosh, how can I even narrow this down? But we wanted to be close to our children who live in the United States. So that immediately made us focus on Latin America as opposed to the Far East, which is too far. And the Europe is not really that convenient. Plus it's a five or six hour time difference, which makes staying in touch between visits problematic. Right, with so the time zone. So those were two at the top of our list and you can continue with a few more. Well, we, uh, we like what we call Goldilocks weather, which is a temperate climate, not too hot, not too cold. And so that was a driving force. Uh, another thing, uh, in addition to proximity to family, was uh, the health care. What, what is the health care? We were in great health, but we knew that we would need that going forward in whatever country we chose. And then we wanted to have access to cultural activities and, uh, and a place where we were, would hope to meet other expats. Yeah, so. so are these some of the things that you talk about in your course? Yes, we do. And actually that is, uh, our, our course is divided into five sections and the very first section is all about techniques in figuring out how to go about deciding where would make you happy in retirement. Well, there's another aspect to it, Kathy, and that is deal breakers, which is the opposite of your wish list. We didn't particularly have any, that's why we did an investigative trip before making the final decision looking for deal breakers. It all looked great on the internet, but we didn't want to, we want to make sure before we pull the trigger that something didn't rear its ugly head that we weren't aware of. But some people do in fact have specific deal breakers. As an example, you need a specific medication and you, everything sounds great about a particular country, but you find out they don't have that medication. Well, it doesn't matter how great it is. You can't move there. 
And another one would be mobility issues. If you have those, then you're not going to pick a place like we live necessarily at high altitude or some place that's, well, in Latin America in general, quite honestly, it's not very... Well, it's not up to standard as yeah. far as uh, in terms of handicap access to places. And, and so all of those are important factors when you're thinking about daily life. I'm curious about what ended up on your spreadsheet, Kathy. Oh, you know, I'm happy to post it, but we had yeah. things like, I had a lot of cost things, like how much does it cost for a, a dozen eggs? How much does it cost for, you know, do they have, you know, almond milk, which they probably don't have in Cuenca, you know, where you live. And then I had how many clubs, like, do they have certain clubs? Because we were specifically looking at Del Webb, 55 and older communities. And so we, I was, I wanted an art club and I wanted, uh -huh. you know, this kind of thing. So those were on our list. And I'm actually going to update the list because now that I've been here for um, over nine months, we're recording this for the listener. We're recording this in October. There's some things that, that I'm going to add and probably some things that I will add that have to do with living overseas as well. Cause going from the, from the West coast to the East coast is kind of like living in another country. <laughs> I, yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's kind of like we spent most of our life in the Southeastern part of the United States. And now we visited our family in the Northeast and it's very different. <laughs> yeah, it is different. And so. The items you listed are quite interesting because as we kind of went through ours, ours were pretty general and, and broad. But we tell people in our course, Retirement Reimagine, don't limit, put, don't limit yourself. Put down everything that's important to you and don't think there's any judgment about it because if these are the things that are going to make you happy and not having them are going to make you unhappy, then you need to be honest with yourself yeah. and not think, oh, that's so silly. I really want Jif peanut butter, you know? <laughs> No, but, but it can be a deal breaker for people. The food yeah, is, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I like about different countries are the different foods that you have. When, when my husband and I visited Ecuador, we went to the Galapagos shortly after we got married. I loved the tomato drink that they have there. That's not really made out of tomatoes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tree tomato. Tree tomato. Yeah. And yeah. it's sweet. You know, it's, uh, and it's very good. It doesn't taste like tomato juice. I mean, it, you, it kind of does, but it tastes more like a fruit juice. Yes. And they had these little yellow fruits. I forget what they're called, but I grew some in San Diego. L like we call them Molly's, Aunt Molly's cherries yeah. or something like that. It's very similar, but there are fruits in Ecuador that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. And that was one of the things that I liked about it. But if I wanted... American cherries, I'm probably probably not going to get those in Ecuador, right? Oh, you yes, well, will. They're oh. seasonal. They come up from Peru two or three oh. times a year. <laughs> okay, yeah. so they do have them. And, and so many other things. I mean, we've, uh, particularly in our almost decade living in Ecuador, we've seen so much change during the last 10 years as far as availability of products. But uh, that, that's part of the adventure when you do uh, relocate to another country is discovering the new foods. And, um, and it's, it's, it's exciting, especially if you are a foodie. Exactly. And, and remember, we were there about 10 years ago. So I'm sure that things have changed since we were there. Dramatically. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And so, you know, I mean, these are just things that you want to look at. And on our list was not live there for a certain amount of time before actually purchasing a house. And so my husband and I actually purchased a home in South Carolina without living here first. Oh, okay. And I don't know that I would recommend doing that. We, <laughs> we decided to do it because we didn't want to move again. Yes. You know, the, the cross country move was a lot on us and we, we didn't, we're like, eh, we're not going to rent. We're, we're just going to move. But I would recommend that if you're making a dramatic move like that to rent for six months or a year before you actually plunk down money for a house. Well, and that's something that we're going to kind of, I don't know how to say it exactly, but in the course of the next conversation we have about bank safety. Yes, we'll talk about it. Anything next having to do with uh, <laughs> money in a foreign country, we will discuss that with you because it's important. 
Well, and then yeah. the question of, you know, renting versus buying, again, that's something that we always recommend that you rent first. Uh, it's easy to uh, get caught up in the euphoria of the newness of everything and just say, oh, I've got to buy this. It's, it's such a great bargain and I love it. And then once you're there for a while, you just may not have picked the right neighborhood. Or and maybe you don't ever want to buy a place. That's right. Like us. And maybe we don't own. Rent. We've decided to rent. And we're just happy as clams renting. Right. And so maybe, maybe that is you know, on your checklist, you know, do I really, you know, live there for some time yep. first and then decide whether or not you really do want to buy yeah. a place or if you just want to rent because there's a lot of advantages to renting. My husband and I just spent almost $3,000 fixing our air conditioner. Mm -hmm. And had we been renting, that would not have been our expense. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So it has to do, to, particularly, I think, you know, at this age, you think more about preserving uh, your assets instead of just paying for whatever you need to pay for because that next paycheck is going to just keep coming and coming and coming. But when you're retired, particularly when you're on a fixed income, you, you have to be, uh, I guess, more diligent about how you spend your money. Right. So what are the, some of the other things that you talk about in your course? Or oh, in where do we start? Ed? Go well, ahead. Let's see. <laughs> well, beyond beyond giving a lot of great information to discover uh, what it is you're looking for, we, we go on to talk about how to help you figure out the country and the place within the country that's right, right. for you. Yeah, that and is how a whole do section. You figure, yeah, how do you figure out the country? I mean, a lot of people are nervous to go to a country where they don't speak English, but I have to tell you, when I was in England, they speak English, but I had a hard time understanding the people in Wigan. That was very difficult to understand. I understood the people in London, no problem. But the people in Wigan, I had a, I had a little bit of trouble understanding. So English may or may not be a big issue for people, but aren't English-speaking countries more expensive? Yeah, in some ways. Yeah. I mean, but here's in South America, Guyana is an English speaking country what, known only for the Jim Jones terrible thing years ago. It's an extremely poor country that nobody really particularly wants to live in. So English isn't necessarily, you know, the yes or no. Yeah, the determining factor, but it is important. The, the places within the countries that we spotlight have established expat communities within those locations. And so, that's a good uh, that's a good factor to look for. Is there an expat community there? Because if there is, then at least you know that there are English speakers there. I'm talking about you know North Americans, and predominantly that's what you would be looking at if you are a North American. Yeah, if, if you want to live off the grid and you're fluent in whatever language it is that you're interested in, then go for it. But that doesn't describe most people. I mean, our wish list that we were talking about, become fluent in Spanish, was not on that list. No. no. <laughs> but we learned. I mean, we thought we were going to perish because we showed up with such poor Spanish. But we learned that functional is the goal, not, not fluency. Fluency is a lofty goal, but it's not necessary. If that's your personal thing, do that. And but, use Google Translate if you need to. Exactly. Yeah, and honestly, we uh, if we have an issue with our apartment, we that's how we talk to our landlord. He has no interest in learning English. And so to talk about very specific things about, you know, this faucet is leaking or whatever, that's just not conversational um, Spanish that we would typically know. We can we can order food and we can get home and we know what things are in the grocery store and we can chat it up a little bit about the weather and, and a few other things, but that's about it really. Like I said, we, we have a lot of English speakers in our world. We've been fine. Yeah. You know, you had sent us an article that we were going to refer to about countries that specifically where the most American retirees collect their social security check. And it was a very interesting list because like Canada was on top and Japan was number two. And Isn't that strange? Well, the, well it's, it is and it isn't. The, the article was a bit misleading in this way. Think of how many Canadians just cross the border every day and work in the north part of the United States. But when they get 
done with that. They just stay in Canada. And yeah, in the case of Japan, that. I'm looking at this list, Germany, the Philippines, these are all places with strong military presence, mm. U.S. military presence. And in most cases, I would argue that someone has married a local there and they just have decided to stay in that country. That's what my uh, brother did. The other yeah. thing that was somewhat, not misleading, but just it doesn't tell the whole story, this was a list of where American retirees collect Social Security checks. Many, many expats, including us, don't collect their Social Security checks in the country they're living in. They maintain a U.S. banking presence, mm. have their check there, and just pull money out of ATMs locally. So we'll, we'll talk would, more about that next year. Yeah, we would not have been part of that statistic. Isn't that and, interesting? Because I would think that there are more Americans living in Mexico. Well, Mexico is number three on the list, and there, Mexico is by far the highest number of U.S. expats. But, I mean, like Costa Rica and other ones like that that are real popular, Panama, I don't even see them, and they may be somewhere down the list that I'm looking at. But, again, a lot of the expats that live there don't necessarily bank there. Bank there or if right. they do, they bank like we do. We have a local banking presence but it's just to put some money in to automatically pay our, our few ongoing bills, like now, electricity and stuff. I have a question about, as of today, which again is being recorded in October of 2019, this episode won't be released until 2020. What? But <laughs> uh, we can talk about that offline, but uh, my the, the people in my Facebook group know why. <laughs> I am... I am overwhelmed right now. Uh, okay. We're just teasing. Yeah, to get all the editing and everything done. But right now, there's still in the news a, a lot about people in Ecuador that are unhappy, that are, you know, and this happens all over the world where people are protesting. How do you make the decision based on political, what, what could happen politically to the country? Because when I first started talking with my husband about moving overseas, that was hit one of his main concerns about the politics could change and then all of a sudden you're not welcome there anymore and here you've, you've built a life and it could be per potentially dangerous. And so how do you, how is that on your list of things to look at? Well, that's, that's a real concern. This list of top places to retire abroad is somewhat fluid. So depending on your time frame, that's something you need to take a look at. Uh, the, the economy, the stability of the government of the country that you're, that you're talking about uh, transplanting yourself to. Yeah, I mean, on the list that this article, one, two, three, four, five, Philippines is number six. Well, again, we have a big U.S. military presence in the Philippines. Philippines is not on our list of 10 countries because it's a very volatile government situation there. And the, the leader of that country is really harsh. So, and Nicaragua has been on some, it's never on ours, but it's been on some of the people that list these countries, place to retire, great place to retire. But they, again, have some really volatile situations going on right now, whereas Costa Rica doesn't even have a standing army. That's how peaceful that place is. And Panama, because of the, the um, international financial stuff that happens there in trade, they're not going anywhere as far as having some crazy, crazy political situations. And the, what's going on right now in Ecuador, as a friend of ours emailed us, won't know if we were okay, protesting is just kind of a way of life in Latin America. And, <laughs> and they protest stuff all the time. This one just happened to make the news. The protests are not like citywide and turning over cars and all that kind of stuff. They just hold up signs and, and fuss about whatever they're fussing about. And it's normally just in the, the central square of the cities. So we live a 20 minute walk away. And as I told our friend, life is just, life as usual just that short distance away. So it's just interesting how the, the news reports things and you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt sometime because you, 
Well, it's just sensationalism sells. Yeah. When I was younger, I used to participate in certain protests. Well, and if the, if the media was going to be there, there'd be like 10 of us. And they'd make us all squish together to make it look like there was a whole bunch of us. And really, there was like 10 people. <laughs> yeah. yes. We're children of the 60s, so we were we, we understand. involved in some of those as well. It was more, not that we were that hardcore, but it was just kind of a fun thing to do. Right. <laughs> it was just an activity for the day. That's what I did. I wasn't <laughs> really that pro or con, whatever I was protesting years. This is years and years ago. Yes, they but, were um, but yeah, it was just something to do that day. <laughs> when you're a teenager, yes. protesting has a different meaning than when you're older. I agree. So getting back to what we were talking about with where to retire, it starts with deciding what you want, not what you read about or think other people would want you to do, and certainly not where you like to vacation necessarily. That may work out, but often that turns into some disappointment because you go on vacation to get away from your daily life, not for it to become your daily life. And once you've decided what's really important to you, and a lot of people have never asked themselves that question, what do I want? Once you decide what you want without any restrictions and without any judgment, then the the countries and places within those countries just start or sort of rise to the top like the cream. And the ones that just sound lovely and wonderful, but you think, I don't know if I can do that all the time. Then, um, oh, another thing I'll recommend to anybody that's listening, go with the worst time of year, weather-wise, whatever that is, not the best time. Because we had friends that moved to a place in Panama. I'm not going to mention where. But um, they, they visited during the dry season, moved there during the wet season. They didn't know that God was capable of releasing that much rain onto the planet Earth at one time. And it just went on day after day after day. And they ended up in Cuenca because they just couldn't take it. So the, the message there is if you like it during the worst time of the year, you'll love it during the rest of the time. So do that to make sure. That is good advice. That's what my husband and I did. We visited South Carolina a year ago in August. And we said, if we can take it in August, we can take it anytime. Well, then, of course, this year was the worst heat wave they've ever had. And it was much hotter this year than it was last year. And my husband's looking at me like, did we make a mistake by coming here? <laughs> but the good news is our air conditioning is fixed and we, we have great air conditioning. So, you but yeah, I agree with you. Go during the worst time. I uh -huh. wholeheartedly agree. Absolutely. So what other tips do you have for the listener who's trying to decide where they might retire? Um, you know, anything else that is perhaps you can give us a, a little tip that's in the course or something to think about? Well, um, I will just add quickly, uh, think about uh, the, the top 10 considerations, the, the cost of living, the climate, the quality of the health care, the, the living arrangement, buying versus renting. Those are the, the top things that are going to affect your daily life. And so be sure to look at those things in addition to do they have Jeff peanut butter or, you know, <laughs> do they have an art club? Yeah, <laughs> right. figure, figure out as best you can if you're not right on retirement age what your retirement income is actually going to be. You can go to the social security website and it can give you an estimate of what your at different levels, 62, 66 and 70, what your monthly um, benefits going to be. And that combined with your savings, you can get a rough estimate of what the heck do I actually, am I going to be able to spend on a monthly basis? The great news about retiring abroad is that in many cases, like in ours, we're living on social security. So, our nest egg is totally preserved and in fact has grown because of um, high interest rates that we enjoy with the banks there. But it's not just for people who don't have too much money, for people that do have money and do have savings, but are afraid that they may outlive their money, which is the second biggest consideration besides not having any at all. Um, 
it's a moving abroad is kind of a capital preservation strategy that's really not talked about in the media at all. Do you feel that now that you've moved abroad, you moved originally for the ability to save money. Now that your nest egg has grown, do you feel like in that 10 years it's grown enough if you wanted to just completely move back to the U.S., you could? Um, I would say that we probably could find a place where we could make that work. Would we be as happy as we are living abroad? And, and having... would you be eating out and uh, well, having a yeah. housekeeper? Well, that's the whole thing. We would have to dramatically scale back the lifestyle that we enjoy living abroad. And I don't think we're ready to do that. <laughs> no, not when uh, not when we can leave keto and be in Newark, which is near our daughter's home in six hours. Yeah, you know, that's great. it's what's the what's the reason? Right. And you get the wonderful lifestyle. We're gonna talk a little bit about keto next week, where you've decided to live. Um, the listeners have heard me say before that. My husband and I actually looked at keto and, or not keto, Cuenca. We looked at Cuenca. Yeah, I mentioned keto because that's where the international airport is. Cuenca, we have to fly to keto and then from keto to Newark. Right, right. But we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about this whole issue with bank fraud. And um, so for the listener, if you're interested in learning what we you know, there's right now, there's a lot in the news. I don't know if you've heard it about some bank fraud that's going on in Mexico. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll talk about why they decided on Cuenca in our next episode. Do you want to say anything to the listener before we say goodbye? Well, um, thanks for listening, I guess. Yeah, do you have anything to say? <laughs> well, I would just encourage people to be open-minded about this whole topic. It's a lot of people are held back by different kinds of fears and it's not that scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Do you want to give a way for the listener to reach out to you? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, if you go to www.edandcynthia.com, my name is spelled with two D's, but if you misspell it, it'll still redirect <laughs> you there. Oh, that's E D D E D D and Cynthia.com. Great. Thanks so much for coming on the show again. And for the listener, we'll see you next time Thank on you. Rock Your Retirement. Bye. Bye. Bye.